Good morning. Being from Gainesville, Florida, I'd like to say that our weather would be more friendly to you, but uh, from a pre presenter standpoint, it's, um, it gives us an opportunity to have you in here with us, so we appreciate you coming this morning. We did get our presentation in in time, and in your handout packet there is a copy of the slides and some notes pages, and we'll also post this on our website at the NCCER. Uh, I'm Steve Green, by the way. Ted and I uh, do a number of presentations around the nation on a number of topics, and one of the things that I'll do today is kind of kick this off, talk about training um, in your industry, talking specifically about some of the things that we're doing for iron workers, operators, uh, rod busters, and others. I wanted to give you a little bit of history. I actually had the opportunity back in 1996 to address your board of directors. There was a meeting, uh, for those of you that may have been there, a meeting in New Hampshire. And I flew up, and, and that's when we made our first presentation to uh, the steel erectors to develop curriculum specific for your industry and to provide an educational foundation. So I wanted to remind you that we both, uh, Ted and his organization and the NCCR, we have booths over in the tent. It's dry over there. There are nice umbrellas between uh, covered walkways, and we'd love for you to come by. I'll also mention that North American Crane Bureau is sponsoring a crane operator rodeo. So even if you're an erector and you're not an operator, we would encourage you to come over and give it your shot. Um, one of the things that uh, we're doing collectively is they are giving away a uh, registration and a chance to um, participate in the National Crane Operator Finals in Las Vegas in November. I'll let Ted talk about that. And then uh, we're going to donate to their organization to give to the winner a GPS. So if there's, uh, if there's not an incentive to go out in the rain, you may at least want to go over there and practice on their mobile crane simulator, which uh, we have actually done some alignment with and are uh, providing uh, simulation exercises within the practical side of the curriculum that we've built for the industry. A couple of other things. Tomorrow morning, uh, Don White, our president, and myself will talk in a general session about the NCCER. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about that today. I want to talk more focused about relevant education. We're going to talk a little bit about our certification programs. I see uh, Joel Oliva with NCCCO in the back, and uh, I know that we all look forward to hearing Joel give an update on his organization a little bit later this morning. So we'll try to keep it on schedule for Joel and the other presenters. Um, one thing I will mention is, uh, unfortunately, I think the schedule is that the, uh, the, the uh, show will end over in the, the tent this evening, Duff, is that correct? Is, uh, so today is the last day. Uh, one of the things that we always do is have our publisher, Pearson Education, send curriculum, textbooks on the various trades and, and management and safety. I will encourage you because even though I'm only a two-hour drive away, I'd prefer to give those away since the publisher gave them to us than to take them back. So at the end of the day, uh, 4.30 or so when it finishes over there, please come by, do the rodeo with North American Crane Bureau, and if there's any specific curriculum that you see on the table that you would like to take home, we would encourage you to take that sample home with you. If in the event that the curriculum, and we have some catalogs over there, but if your particular trade areas or interests are not still there or we did not bring those, if you will take one of my cards, uh, you can send me an email and say, Steve, I, I saw you in uh, Tampa would like to get a copy of the mobile crane operations curriculum or the structural iron working curriculum or the reinforcing iron worker curriculum or whatever it may be. So I encourage you to do that. <clears throat> Let me uh, share a couple of things before we get started. Um, unfortunately, in an economic downturn as we're experiencing today, uh, oftentimes employee education and training programs and apprenticeships are the first to go. We'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, but obviously a concern of ours at the NCCER is the fact that um, a lot of the apprentices, the helpers in our industry in all trade areas are sometimes the first to go. I will share with you not as a, um, uh, not as a threat, I don't have a crystal ball, 
but if this is like any other economic recession and we recover, uh, which is planned in the next 18 months, uh, your shortages and your skill shortages will come back with a vengeance. So I would encourage you at this time to be prepared for the upswing, uh, to do the right things, not only with your existing employees and apprentices and helpers, but also be prepared for future regulation. I know Joel's gonna talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, be prepared for legislation uh, during this administration's time that will, uh, in, that will obviously enforce training and safety as they have already made clear. Secretary Solis has already said there is a new sheriff in town as it relates to OSHA inspectors and regulation. So I would just encourage you to be prepared for that upswing. A uh, gentleman named Daryl Luzo, uh, president of the National Career Development Association, recently stated the following, American career technical education is being redefined because the needs of the evolving U.S. and world economies are changing. Educators at all levels are recognizing the fact that the world's employers increasingly need skill sets that the conventional four-year college degree does not give. Um, According to research performed for the Gates Foundation at the Hudson Institute, students who have a CTE program associate's degree, a career and technical education associate's degree, or an apprenticeship certificate routinely make anywhere from $2,000 to $20,000 more per year than those people without the appropriate skills education. I'll share that with you because obviously uh, between now and 2016 and 2018 respectively, our industry, construction, maintenance, uh, and manufacturing related to construction is expected to grow to over 8.7 million workers. Today we're down to around 7 million. We've lost almost a million workers in our industry. Uh, the other interesting dynamic to that, as you well imagine, as you look at your 401k accounts, as do I, uh, there's been a lot of erosion of the retirement opportunities for employees. But as our markets continue to improve as they have over the last year or six months, and as people continue to get into the graying time of their lives, we're going to see more and more people leave our industry. So those growth numbers do not include attrition, those people that are losing uh, their jobs or leaving their jobs for retirement or other opportunities. I'll have you keep that in mind. Um, let's talk a little bit about our objectives today. Uh, we've got about uh, 30 more minutes and, and I'm going to talk for about 10 more. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some crane fatalities and statistics related to, to uh, steel erection. And we'll talk about employee training, curriculum, uh, qualification and certification. I'm going to toss over to Ted. Ted's going to talk for about 20 minutes also. Uh, which includes assessment and certification, credentials, and some new programs that we have, and hopefully we'll have time for a little Q&A. Uh, you may subscribe to Engineering News Record. Back in 2008, you'll recall there were a number of incidences with, with cranes, primarily tower cranes, uh, in some major cities that brought about a resurgence of interest at the state, local, and federal level for regulation for certification and training of workers. Um, some of the recent fatality studies uh, that came from uh, research done by the Center to Protect Workers' Rights, uh, which is a building trades research organization. In 2008, they produced a study at the University of Tennessee in 2006, and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, also in 2006 released a 10-year ten, ten fatality study. And they had some key findings, and I want to focus on two of those. Increased and more frequent training for workers and supervisors, and certification for operators, riggers, signalers, inspectors to verify competency. Um, as we look more at those statistics, I wanted to focus in on some of those 632 crane-related deaths. 191 of those fatalities were construction laborers. 101 were equipment operators themselves. Um, 86 were nine manual workers, administration, supervision, and managers. 42 were iron workers, 41 were mechanics, 24 welders, and then an assortment of other various trade areas where we saw fatalities from these crane incidences. Uh, the majority were due to electrocution, which uh, you probably are familiar with. 
Uh, likewise, there were a number of struck bys, I believe 132 deaths, uh, falls 56 deaths. So without going into a lot of detail, there's a lot of good research out there, and I would recommend that you take a look at some of those. But some of the common hazards and accident causes all focus around the employee training aspect, such as erection and dismantling, operating errors, rigging, overloading, signaling, communication. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. There is a requirement to train. The, um, the Federal Register states that the employer shall instruct each employee in the recognition and the avoidance of unsafe conditions and the regulations applicable to his or her work environment. But let's talk about that from a relevant standpoint instead of a regulatory standpoint. We performed a study two years ago with the Construction Industry Institute, if you're familiar with that, out of the University of Texas in Austin, uh, in conjunction with the Construction Users Roundtable, or CURT. And what we saw that for every dollar that you invest in training, you get a minimum of a dollar thirty back, but in many cases up to 300 percent return, or three dollars per dollar invested. But we also saw some amazing statistics related to first aid. Uh, by the way, that study is available on the CII website. It's RT231 research. But we saw that there was a productivity improvement of over 10 percent, both in the construction and maintenance environment. Uh, turnover and absenteeism decreased 14 and 15 percent. Injury decreased by over 25 percent. In fact, in some cases, we saw up to a 90 percent reduction in first aid cases. Uh, from these studies. These studies included over a hundred training centers and, and schools that were both union and non-union and we also visited about two dozen of these training centers and then we, the, then we visited a number of both union and non-union job sites and saw that the statistics were similar for both types of jobs no matter what the labor posture that we saw significant improvements in productivity and reductions in first aid cases. So what types of training are there available? And once again, we have some curriculum at the table. Love to have you come by and talk with us. North American Crane Bureau, our partner, also does a number of specialty training uh, sessions and programs. They can do them in one of their many offices or they can do them at your location. So we have crane operator training for mobile cranes, tower cranes, overhead and gantry cranes. We have crane operator technical instructor training. Those are the people that actually train your operators and train your riggers. So we actually train people to instruct others through an instructor certification program. We have a crane operator certifier program where we buy, thereby train and certify people to do performance of ver verifications and practical examinations for cranes, rigging, and signal persons. We have crane inspector training through North American Crane Bureau, and then we have iron worker training for both structural and reinforcing. And uh, these are offered in a number of locations on our website. There are training locations listed by the click of a button, by, by cursor, uh, using your cursor and mousing over that. Uh, we also have rigging training in a variety of ways, from beginner through intermediate and up to advanced, and then signal person training. Uh, specialty training, some of the things that uh, you'll notice over in the booth, uh, there is a mobile crane simulator. North American Crane Bureau also has an additional simulator for overhead and gantry crane and recently have released a tower crane simulator. So there's an opportunity to actually put people into a simulation environment, reduce the opportunity for accident as well as your workers' comp costs, your fuel costs, your rental and lease and purchase costs, and actually give people that hands-on feel before you put them in the field. But there's mobile cranes, truck cranes, uh, boom trucks, tower cranes, overhead, the list goes on to include all sorts of scissors lifts, aerial lifts, snorkel lifts, uh, as well as rigging, rigging gear, and specialty safety training that is available out in the market. There's a lot of good training going on. There is association, uh, industry association training through AGC and ABC. Uh, there are great union programs that are available out there for training both through the operating engineers as well as through the iron workers. Um, there is uh, a number of contractors that do great training out there because they have their own accredited training facilities. And then we're seeing more and more resurgence into the secondary and post-secondary school market of skills-related training through their career and technical education programs. 
Uh, training recommendations. Obviously, your curriculum, wh wherever you get it, should be competency-based. You want to make sure that at the end of the day, what you teach, people retain, and that they're able to regurgitate that, and that they should be comprehensive. Uh, likewise, you should train people to equipment-specific, not necessarily manufacturer-specific. Now, I say that with tongue-in-cheek because I know there are some manufacturers here, and there are probably some in here today. And not that manufacturers don't do great training because they do. In fact, I think that anyone would be remiss not to have a careful blend of manufacturer-specific training for the type of equipment, rigging hardware, um, uh, programs that, that they offer themselves. But one thing that there should be is portability of training. So once you credential that person for competence, then they ought to be able to take that training from state to state or even country to country, as we often see. Uh, and there should be significant time, I would say more than 50% for the laboratory or the practical side. So with that, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to toss this over to Ted. I'm going to step back on in a little bit after Ted uh, updates you on some of the certification programs that are available out there for you. And then we'll try to take some questions at the end. Ted? Good morning. I had to find the off switch, I think, so I don't have a feedback. But we'll just see if it gets feedback first. Um, we're going to move on and talk a little bit about Operator Certification Program for, that NCCER has. We partnered with them a couple, three years ago. Um, there is a requirement to be qualified. And if you look at the slide, it says operators shall be required to successfully meet qualifications for the specific type of cranberries they operate. And that's B30.5 2007 and the newer versions. But the types listed in ASME, there's 10 particular and indefinite or finite types that are described under ASME. The employer has to ensure that an operator is qualified to be on a piece of equipment. And in this case, we're talking about mobile cranes. That goes a little farther. I always like to get this out. We tend to want to rely on one thing and put it in a box. It's kind of tough on, on cranes to put it in the box because even though ANSI says there's 10 types, inside those types, how many different kind of cranes are there? There's lots and lots and lots of cranes. So as an employer, your responsibility of making sure someone's qualified can't fit in any box. So you have a responsibility if you have a piece of equipment to make sure they can operate that piece of equipment. So what I'm saying is there's three certification programs out there that I'm aware of, and there's probably more going to come online down the, down the pike because people like choices, people like different things. That's why there's Ford, Chrysler, and Chevrolet, and Toyota, and, 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 and all the other manufacturers out there because people like choice. So what I'm saying here is no matter which one of those three programs that you choose, the employer ultimately is, has the responsibility to make sure that his personnel is qualified on that particular piece of equipment. So one size of any program doesn't fit all and holds up and says, you know, you, you can't hold that up to OSHA or somebody and say, well, this guy took this test. OSHA may come back and say, yeah, but nowhere in that test did he set on this particular crane. So whose responsibility is it? It's yours as an employer. So you have to know that. Now, the certification process makes it a lot easier for you makes it a lot easier for you because it can get a large grouping of what you have that you're already out there with. You gotta watch for that unique stuff and it's your responsibility to make sure your people are qualified. Here's why you wanna certify. Whether it's operators, riggers, mobile crane operators, tire crane operators, overhead crane operators, whatever that you're doing. Training and certification is gonna improve your ability to reduce accidents, you'll have fewer deaths, less property damage or less property damage, favorable insurance rates. In some cases, there's insurance companies out there that will cut your rates if you have these certifications. Um, we need to be proactive in self-policing. That's why certification is out there. The, the certification programs that are out there today started for that reason, and that reason was the biggest reason they started to police themselves before the government got involved. They are involved now and they're going to help us to police ourselves. It helps to provide status to that person as a professional. Brings them on board, makes them feel like they've accomplished something in their job. Improves public industry, uh, the image of the industry. 
drastically does that. Lowers equipment repair costs. The net result is increasing your training and going through the certification helps you, helps your operators. Here's the four written assessment categories that, in, um, that NCCER has. Actually, we have two written assessment categories. But we have four written tests. There's two schools of thought about going into testing. One school of thought is put the core questions in with the specialty. The other school of thought is put the, have a core test and then have specialty tests. We chose the, the route of putting the core questions in with the written test. And we did that for a reason. The first test you're going to see is industrial all-purpose, then boom truck, then telescopic boom, and then lattice boom. Now let me go back up the list backwards because it makes it a little easier. The lattice boom written test has core questions in the testing mechanism. Those core questions relate only to lattice boom cranes. They don't relate to telescopic boom cranes. On the telescopic boom test, the core questions relate only to telescopic boom cranes. Let's say that, that you have a, a group that you deal with that has a taxi crane and they only own telescopic boom cranes. We didn't put the core test together, that, therefore they don't have to have the information on the lattice boom cranes to pass the test for the telescopic boom crane. Don't need to know everything. You don't have to go through the whole gambit. You only go through what they need to test. If they're going to operate them both, they have to know that information anyway because they're going to go back and take the lattice boom test. They'll get those core questions in the lattice boom test. So we separate them out. These two tests are cutouts of the telescopic boom test. These are our core tests. If you take the telescopic boom test, in a minute we'll get into practical exams. You'll be able to take any of the level of practical exam for the telescopic boom. If you take the lattice boom, then you'll be able to take any of the cutouts for the lattice boom. This test, the boom truck test, if you take it, the core questions are only applicable to a boom truck, and so are the specialty questions. Covers a lot of boom trucks, articulating as well as, as, well as um, telescopic. But once you do that, you can only take a practical exam on what? Boom trucks. You can't take it on a rough terrain. You can't take it on any of the higher areas. You can only take it on boom trucks. Think about a Home Depot or a Lowe's that's got a fleet of boom trucks. It's all they own. So they train their operators on boom trucks. Got a great program inside those operations. So now they only test on this area. Same thing with industrial boom cranes. I can take you to one chemical plant in New Jersey that has 250 operators that operate 12 industrial cranes. The only thing they have on the site. Anything bigger than that, they contract out. Now, 250 operators on 12 cranes is a little crazy, but that's one of their deals that they have going. But they, they do 250 operators on these 12 cranes. There's lots of companies out there that only have these. So the only thing that's on that written test is information pertinent to industrial carry deck type cranes like draughts. That's all you can test on if you take that. Now, if you needed to test on both of these plus a rough terrain, then which test would you take? the telescopic boom test, and then you could test on all of them. There wouldn't be any reason to take four tests. You take these two, and you can test on everything we have. So now when we move into the practicals, we have four categories divided into subcategories. We have industrial all-purpose crane, and then we have rubber tire truck mount crane, rough terrain, all-terrain, and then crawler mount. Those are the four categories of practical exams. Now we break those down further. Under the industrial all-purpose, you can only test on industrial all-purpose. Under rough terrain, all-terrain, it's broken down very closely to the 10 types that ANSI or ASME calls out. Rough terrain, all-terrain, single control station, fixed controls. We call that a neck breaker in the industry. Rough terrain, all-terrain, single control station, rotating controls, rotating cab. RT518, RT522, where you set in the cab, rotate with the boom. So you have to take two. You can't take this one and get this one. The system doesn't work that way. So you go take the written exam for telescopic boom, and if you have both machines, then you literally take both practical exams. 
rubber tire mount breaks down to rubber tire truck mount, telescopic boom, fixed controls, rubber tire truck mount. Um, now, I will tell you that there's a, there's a little typo in this. That should be rubber tire boom truck. I apologize for that. These first four are boom trucks. Telescopic boom, fixed control, telescopic boom, rotating controls, articulating boom, fixed controls, articulating boom, rotating controls. So we break out a separate practical exam for the arti articulating boom. And for instance, you take a national, uh, I don't know which number it would be, that's got a pedestal. You're sitting up there operating the controls. You can move from either side and you know, operate the control station. Then that would be the fixed controls. But national also makes one that looks nearly like a um, uh, rotating cab truck crane. It's got four outriggers. It's almost an independent package, but it's still a boom truck because it's on a commercial carrier. It's not on a carrier that was designed to carry a crane. So it's on a tr commercial truck mount. So that would be the rotating controls for the fixed boom down here. And the same thing with articulating. We break articulating out because there's some functionalities that are different. And then down here we have rubber tire truck mount, telescopic boom, all terrain, which would be a um, dual control station, an all terrain that has a control station to drive the carrier and one that has it to operate the carrier. So there's dual controls. Then rubber tire lattice boom friction machinery, rubber tire lattice boom hydraulic machinery. This is where we break a little a bit away from the ASME requirements and went a little step further. There's nothing in the standards that says you can't exceed, it just says you don't want to go less than, than, than what they call out. We felt, and what 35, 40 subject matter experts felt like there is a significant difference in operating a triple eight and a 4100. A triple eight is an all hydraulic machine and a 4100 is what? All friction. None of us were really afraid of the guy who had operated the 4100 moving into a triple eight. That didn't bother us. What bothered us was someone who'd never been in a 4100 operating a triple eight under a card that says, you know, I'm a lattice boom crane operator and he moves into a 4100. That scared us. Completely different operation. To me, that would be like getting out of an Audi with an automatic transmission and jumping into a Peterbilt with a 15-speed Spicer or something or a Fuller. It, it's a huge difference in the way you move from one thing to the other. So we decided that both on the truck mount unit and on the crawler mount, we'd break it down in those categories. We'd break it between friction and hydraulic. So you have to take a practical exam on both. And then we have crawler mount telescopic boom. And then we have crawler mount lattice boom friction, crawler mount lattice boom hydraulic. So there's 13 conceivable practical exams that you can take. Sounds like a lot. Most people don't take all 13. It sounds like a lot. However, we felt like it goes back to choices again. It's your choice how you want to do the system. The other issues that we, we, we do with this is on the rough terrain crane, there's actually, well, we'll get to this in a minute because I think it, I would be getting ahead of myself. Just so you'll have an idea, here's what the practical, um, it says the practical does not have any choices for machinery specifics, but it has it by type. So if you look here, here's the carry decks. Here's the fixed control station up here, like the neck breaker, rotating down on the bottom. I'll give you a, just a thumbnail or a picture. Telescopic boom crawler. Um, then we have lattice crawler and friction crawlers. I'm not sure those aren't both hydraulic crawlers. And then on the boom truck, telescopic fixed controls, boom truck, telescopic rotating controls. It's accurate. We got it right here. But there's the boom truck. Um, there's a, a large lattice boom truck mount, and then here's a telescopic truck mount, a rubber tire. Then this, looking at our boom trucks again, there's the pedestal, 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 different types of boom trucks. There's the rotating cab boom trucks. And these are getting pretty large now. You, you see these getting very, very large. Actually, it seems to me like we're going back 
because originally truck mounted cranes were like this. They were pretty much on commercial carriers when they first came out. They were modified commercial carriers and then manufacturers started designing the carriers for the cranes. And then this is articulating booms, knuckle booms, whatever you want to call them. I call them glorified backhoes without a bucket. That's what I call them. But. And then articulating boom with a rotating control. He's setting up here. And, and in this case, you know, there's not a hook on this one, but we're using it just to give you an idea of what it sets up on. Telescopic boom, all terrain. Here's an all terrain, five axle. Here's an all terrain, four axle. Another all terrain, another all terrain. Lattice boom friction, 5530 American. Tough old machine. Hydraulic. Here's one of the newer Mammoth Walks, one of the newer Americans. These are completely different and a lot more unique to operate than, than uh, actually I shouldn't say unique, a lot, I think they're a lot easier and more controllable for an operator than a 4100. There's not as many things to go wrong. Okay, now here's a sample of our practical examination for a rough terrain crane. There is a requirement on a rough terrain crane that they drive the crane. We physically have them get in the crane and accomplish the course. They have to move the crane, manipulate it into here, and in the manipulation they have to crab it and tram it if it has those capabilities. At least one rotation, one tire rotation. They bring it in here, stop it, that's one task. And then the next task is to set the outriggers up. They set them up, they level them. And then at that point, there's a target layout. A couple slides over, we'll show you how the certified practical examiner has to set up the, the, the actual target. So they go out, they hit target one, that's a task, they come out to two and then come over to three, that's one task. It's timed, they, they have to do it in a certain length. Then they run through the slalom course. The slalom course is set up specific, and again we'll do that in a minute, but there's a certain dimension between here and here. Then we have a height that they go by. The targets, the cones are like 36 inches, and they have to stay inside that 36 inches. Can't hit the cones, can't hit the ground, some other things. And this shows you how they come into the course. And this, there's also a setup in here that tells the certified practical examiner how to set it up. Now there is a, a, a section of this that the CPE or the certified practical examiner has to be trained. If you, if, how many of you in here are NCCER uh, assessment centers or training sponsors? Anybody? Yeah, as an NCCER training or assessment center, there's some, you're on a fast track. If you need to, if you want to do the crane uh, certification program, you can do that through your assessment. You have to get an endorsement and there's a little, you, you pay a fee, you go through, you have to have a CPE, your administrator has to go back and get some webinar training and some things like that to upgrade them to understand the program. But at that point, then you're allowed internally to administer this. You could do this in-house, but there's, it, and it's just like any other program, it's ANSI accredited. There's specific criteria that you, when you're high in CCER is, they're not going to let you get away with anything. So they, they audit you, make sure everything's done right. They'll audit you before the program starts. But that CPE has to be trained. There's a program, we provide the CPE training, and we train them on how to administer the practical exam, how to set up the practical exam. The practical exam is set up for the specific crane using the load chart and using specific angles, etc. cetera. Um, this kind of tells you how to set the targets up. If you look, this is just one for a rough terrain. It says locating target one. Use manufacturer's range diagram. Hydraulic cranes with main boom lengths, um, boom lengths up to and including 50 feet, use a 45 degree angle. For target one, up to 51, up to 101, up to 150, up to 200, we have different angles. So let's just use the 51 foot to 100, we'd use a 50 degree boom angle. So if you were testing an RT522 that had the capabilities of 150 foot of boom, I don't know if it does or not, I'm just saying that, no matter where in the world that you set up that RT522 that had that 150 foot of boom, it would be set up identical, as long as those practical examiners followed the guidelines. 
So each time that particular model number of crane configured with that much boom was tested, the test is the same all over the world. It's the same thing if it were um, a Grove RT58D, a neck breaker, and it only had 75 foot of boom. They'd still use a 50 foot, 50 degree angle, but every time it was set up, it'd be set up the same. Location, you locate target three next, that's this target. First we get target one, and what we do is we take that 55 degree boom angle and we find the load radius for target one. Let's say that load radius is 100 feet. Well, you know, it'll, it'll come out over here, but then to locate target three, which is the nearest target, with boom links up to and including 150 foot, we use a 70 degree angle. That means you look at the range diagram, come down and at 70 degrees, you use that radius. So whatever that radius is, you measure it from the center of rotation to that point. That's target three. You add those two numbers up, divide them by two. Then you take two tape measures and go from this point to this point, and where they intersect is where target two's at. So now you got target one, target two, target three. On that crane, on that model number crane, anywhere in the world, it'll be set up exactly the same, as long as the instructions are followed. So marking each one of them. Now, there are some uh, changes to the target areas that are coming out, but that'll go on. But four foot's what we use now. We are going to make the target size smaller. After two years of using it, we found that we should reduce the size. We'll let you come back up on this one. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Um, Fourteen years ago, when I first met with this group, I explained that I was a carpenter by trade which is why Ted talks about this and I don't. Uh, I did want to talk about the importance of industry recognized credentials and some of the things that we do. For any training uh, that you take utilizing NCCR processes, we provide transcripts, no different from a high school or a college or a community college transcript. And that is portable and it follows you anywhere in the world. In fact, we're in 19 countries outside of the United States, and on a daily basis, we touch somewhere around 550,000 students. So those credentials are portable. After completion of an assessment test, like Ted has talked about, or a level of training, which is one year's worth of training or more, then we also issue what's shown there as a wallet card. And then everybody who achieves either an, a uh, certification or a level completion also gets a certificate as is shown in the bottom right hand corner with our ANSI credential where uh, we're now accredited by ANSI from uh, over a year ago, year and a half ago. We also have what's called an automated national registry so as an owner or as a contractor at any time you can go into our database and you can verify that somebody has the training or the assessment and certification that you're requiring. You can't mine the data, you can't uh, if you need a few operators and a half dozen iron workers, you can't go in there and find addresses and names and phone numbers. But what you can do when somebody comes to your gate and they have that card, you can go into our website and you can look up and you can verify that they have training and certification. Um, likewise, a couple other things we're doing right now, we have just completed the development of our tower crane assessment in three uh, different, uh, four different areas, technical skill, uh, job site evaluation, um, normal operations and then capacity charts. Um, and that would cover your, your luffers, your hammerheads, or your fast erect. And uh, this is scheduled for release this year and our anticipation is to also apply to ANSI uh, for recognition and accreditation of that program uh, sometime within the next few months. Now the last thing I'll talk about and um, uh, is our rigging program. Over the last eight years, we have certified somewhere around 10,000 riggers. That's either at the beginner or the fundamental phase or at the intermediate or rigging phase. And we have recently rewritten our rigging assessments and have created new programs that we will be applying to ANSI um, within the next few months also for a basic rigor, an intermediate rigor, and an advanced rigor. And we've also created a signal person assessment and practical evaluation. So our plan, uh, working with North American Crane Bureau, is to have the practical evaluations completed uh, within the next 30 days and to also make application to ANSI. 
uh, before uh, year end. So those are some plans for us. And Duff, I'm sorry, I know we went over just a tad bit, uh, but we are both at the booth today. I don't know if we have a minute or two uh, for questions. Duff is shaking his head that we do. So maybe I'll just kind of open it up. Are there any specific questions that anyone would have that they would like to share? Let me also state that uh, we really would like you to come over and do the simulator. Um, we had a uh, same thing. We did a simulator rodeo in at the ABC Craft Championships in San Diego. We had a winner there. They'll be hopefully they'll be at our PDC to compete. We usually have about 250 people at our professional development conference in, in November, and of those, probably 75 are competing in mobile and. 45 or 50 are competing in overhead, and it's, uh, we, we call it the World Championship Simulator Rodeo, and, and uh, for the last, I think this will be about the fifth annual that we've had, and, and they've come from all over uh, to, to go into this rodeo, so we'd be glad for you to do it, and we are giving a certificate to the PDC. You'll have to get there, but we'll give you the, the uh, $1,500 entry or, or registration for free, and you can, if you win the rodeo. So you can come and compete if you choose to. But we, we really would like to see as many of you as possible go over and jump on it. I'm sure they're over there. They were lined up when I, when I left to come over here. They were already on it trying to run through it. Don't be afraid of it. You, can't, you really can't hurt it. I mean, it's, it's a simulator. That's the whole point is, is so that if you turn it over, it really doesn't turn over. So you'll just see it on the screen. But I will caution you that they can vary the environmental uh, conditions, change the weather. Uh, they can put lightning, dark, rain, wind, they can change the load without you knowing it. And in my case, they've uh, forced me to turn over the crane every time I get on it. So uh, uh, be cautious as to who's behind you when you're operating. Uh, we're also, to help you get to Las Vegas, we're throwing in a GPS that, uh, that we'll be giving away to the winner. Uh, Ted warned me that um, I was gonna say that it was an all expense paid uh, first class airfare and all that to Las Vegas, but he also said that he would talk after me. So it, it does include registration to their event, uh, their professional development conference in November, as well as a GPS. Uh, please, once again, come by, uh, take a look at the curriculum if you do not have curriculum that you train your employees with. And uh, at the end of the day today, if you would like, feel, feel comfortable coming by and taking uh, a book or two with you if you have a particular trade area you're interested in. But thank you for your patience. Uh, hopefully tomorrow it's going to be a sunny day and you'll have a nice weekend here. Thank you.